Okay, I am going to uh, take my mask off just so that everybody can hear me. Um, uh, I'd like to welcome everybody. I'm Superintendent Michael Behrman, and uh, it's, it's a pleasure to welcome our community, our school community, to our town hall meeting. Um, certainly, uh, we, if we were in other circumstances, it'd be the preference to do this face-to-face, -face, and we really tried to make it work possibly at uh, the stadium or Shea Ground, uh, but considering there was a presentation to show, uh, it would be very difficult to do. So we settled on doing it virtually, and I appreciate your patience as we work through this. Um, I, I'm sure that uh, uh, there might be some uh, uh, hiccups along the way. Um, at any rate, I'm going to start off by sharing my screen because I do have a brief, I do have a brief uh, presentation. Let me see if I can uh, get my uh, microphone working okay. Someone said that I'm a little quiet. Um, Chris uh, Ceruto. Chris, can you hear me okay? Yes, sir, I can. Okay, do I sound uh, loud enough? Yes, you do. Okay, great. Okay, thank you. Yeah, okay, uh, we're going to go ahead and share my screen, and I have a brief uh, presentation that I'd like to share with you. Then at the conclusion of it, and certainly during the presentation, if you have questions, please type them into the chat, and uh, Mr. Ceruto will uh, keep track of those questions, and following our presentation, um, we'll have a question and answer um, session. So I'd like to uh, give a brief update of, um, uh, first of all, the school reopening roadmap that was released a few weeks ago, as well as the accompanying executive order. And then where we stand as today. I was trying to get to the video. We're going to ask everyone to please unmute themselves. To mute themselves. So, okay, thank you. They're like, I can't. What's this? Did you bring your own butter? Cucumber. Oh. Okay, I apologize. Um, the setting should be configured that everybody is muted. Yeah, there you go. Yeah, we can mute all. Okay. Yeah, we should be good. All right. <laughs> Sorry about that, folks. Um, as we work through the glitches. So our goal is to return to face-to-face -face instruction five days per week in as normal a fashion as possible while keeping all Harbor Springs Public Schools students safe, their families and the staff as well. Um, that, is, that is our goal. On June 30th, Governor Whitmer issued Executive Order 2020-142 and accompanying Return to Michigan Safe Schools, Michigan's 2020-21 Return to School Roadmap, which outlined the steps school districts must follow in order to start the 2021 school year. That was accompanied by an executive order that every district must develop and adopt a COVID-19 preparedness and response plan that informed, that was informed by the Michigan Return to School Roadmap. The plan must describe the policies and procedures that the district will follow for the phase in the region that the district is located 
and be approved by the Board of Education by August 15th and filed with the local intermediate school district by August 17th. So many of you know this, that Michigan is divided into uh, eight different economic regions. Um, these are part of the Michigan Start, Safe Start Economic uh, Development. And we are, our particular region, region six, we are in what is called phase five, um, us and the Upper Peninsula. So um, the state of Michigan phases, the state of Michigan phases are a little bit different from what's called the Michigan Safe Start Map. Um, and only an executive order can change which phase that we are in. So it's a little confusing because if you go on the Michigan Department of Human Services uh, website, you'll see that um, there's risk levels identified by number as well. We are in uh, Traverse City zone, which very similar to the economic phases, uh, but we're in um, a risk phase four. So it's, it's a little confusing. We're not, we're not in phase five of the economic region that guides school openings, but there's another um, indicator that's used called the risk level. And we're actually, um, our region is the lowest risk level now in the entire state. Uh, this map I think was updated July 23rd. So we're in this medium risk category. Um, other regions you can see some are in high risk. Um, the upper peninsula is in a little bit more of a risk situation than we are. So what does this mean for reopening schools in accordance with the roadmap? Phases one through three are um, the, the governor's council in the roadmap has indicated that phases one through three, school will be closed, will be 100% remote. In phase four, there are many requirements. And in phase five, those many requirements, most of them become strong recommendations. So districts must develop plans for each scenario, phases one through three, phase four and phase five, and submit them for approval by the Board of Education by August 15th. To help work through this road plan, uh, we've taken a pretty collaborative approach. Uh, myself, our chief financial officers, uh, chief financial officer, principals from each of the building, department directors from transportation technology and food service, uh, teachers from each level and each building, school counselors, board members, a custodian representative, um, parents from the elementary, middle, and high school level, and health professionals are all part of that task force of 25 members. Together, we are very clear, carefully deciphering the 63 pages in the school return to school roadmap. Um, that roadmap is broken into sections for phases one through three, phase four and phase five. It's extremely detailed. Um, many of the bulleted points are either required, strongly recommended or recommended. And it's broken out down into four categories, safety protocols, mental and social emotional health, instruction and operations. Within each category, um, those are broken down a little further. And you can see here the categories that are covered in, the, in safety protocols. Personal protective equipment would include uh, things like masks, uh, face shields, plexiglass, gloves, etc. cetera. Um, in addition to hygiene, spacing and movement, um, uh, you can see some of the other areas. It gets into safety protocols, get into athletics, uh, proper cleaning protocols, transportation, et cetera. The mental and social emotional health focuses on mental health screening, um, professional development for staff, 
a crisis management plan, uh, how we communicate uh, in case of a crisis, especially if we're in a school closure or we need to close the school, and uh, destigmatization of COVID-19 um, in case we do have positive cases. So we know um, even returning to school in September under normal circumstances, if we were to return, we know that some of our students haven't been in school since middle of March, beginning to mid-March. And that in and of itself um, might make some students feel uncomfortable, out of place, um, a little strange, a little bit off. So that's under the best circumstances. Another category in the uh, school roadmap plan and, and very important obviously is instruction. Um, it covers uh, governance, anywhere from uh, surveying stakeholders to gathering feedback, um, what instruction will look like if it's in person or if a district goes to a hybrid model or it's remote instruction, uh, what, what types of uh, communication and family supports um, do we have put in place and also professional development? Operations includes um, how we manage our facilities during this crisis, uh, anywhere from budget, food service, enrollment, and staffing, um, technology, and transportation. And the thing about all of these four categories, as you can see, there's a lot of crossover. Um, now our task force is broken down into subcommittees that are each working in these uh, separate categories. So the requirements of phase one through three actually are that are, are pretty straightforward. Um, it requires the closure of school buildings to anyone except uh, for specific employees or contractors, as well as licensed childcare employees and families that they serve. Um, we uh, districts in those phases would have to offer alternative modes of instruction other than in-person instruction. Athletics would be suspended along with after school activities and transportation. We would need to provide for food distribution to eligible students and um, continue to pay for school employees and redeploying staff if necessary. This is very similar to the closure that we experienced um, as of March 13th this past year. There is one exception. Um, under the roadmap, uh, licensed childcare would continue to operate. So I wanted to kind of do what I thought would be helpful in the roadmap uh, to summarize uh, some of the requirements and strong recommendations and recommendations. Um, we all know what phase one through three is. Uh, that's a closure of school. But phase four and five is where there's a little bit of differentiation. And what I'd like to do is pull some uh, relevant areas out of the school uh, reopening roadmap and share them with you. My intent is not to read everything. Again, we'll um, put this uh, on the website um, along with the actual PowerPoint presentation for you to peruse on your own. Um, but you can see the difference between phase four and phase five um, comes with required and strongly recommended or recommended. That's one of the biggest differences. Again, right now, our economic region is phase five, and that's what governs our school reopening status as of now, as of today. So um, face masks. Um, I would be lying or not being very transparent if I didn't say that's probably one of the elephants in the room um, for some people. And um, I, I think that, you know, we just need to throw it out there that um, in phase four, these are mostly requirements. Again, in phase five, they become strongly recommended, such as students and staff on school buses, um, whether students are in hallways or common areas, um, uh, for staff. Uh, you can see students in grades six through 12 in the classrooms, phase four calls them a requirement. 
phase five suggests strongly recommended. However, students in grades K through five in classrooms, phase four would be strongly recommended. Phase five is recommended. Spacing and movement. So um, strongly recommended that desks are spaced six feet apart in classrooms for phase four. Phase five, that becomes a recommendation. Um, facing desks in the same direction, you can see, again, um, some of the differences strongly recommended and recommended. Um, specials in the classroom, recommended in both. Uh, physical education held outside when possible, recommended in both. Um, some restrictions on visitors coming into the school. So um, family members or guests, strongly recommended in phase four, recommended in phase five. Um, screening for adults, um, strongly recommended in uh, four, recommended in five. Gathering and food services, um, public indoor assemblies that bring together students uh, from more than one classroom. Um, if they're prohibited, required in phase four, recommended in phase five to prohibit those activities. Um, and then you can see some things related to cafeteria, um, uh, classrooms or outdoor eating uh, areas used for students to eat meals at, um, outside or in classrooms if distancing guidelines can't be met, that's recommended in both. Um, the staggering of meal times um, gets into a little bit of hand washing for food services and then um, extracurricular activities. Uh, field trips, um, off-site field trips that require bus transportation to an indoor location are suspended. That's recommended in phase four. Um, it's um, phase five says, um, it doesn't say recommended or strongly recommended. It says strongly recommended to use face masks. So um, there's, there's some quirks that, uh, um, uh, that we are figuring out as we really delve into the plan, into the roadmap. Um, so in regard to screening staff and students, um, the guidance there is to cooperate with the local health department regarding screening protocols. That's required. In phase five, that was inadvertently left out. However, uh, Lisa Peacock, um, who is the uh, health, uh, the um, health officer for the health department of Northwest um, Michigan served on the council that wrote these and said that it's really required in phase five too. Um, designating a quarantine area to care for students who become ill, um, symptomatic students sent home and kept home until they test negative or completely recovered according to CDC guidelines. Um, Families encouraged to check child's temperature every morning. Uh, some of these are the same, most of them are the same for four and five. And then um, staff, uh, again, conducting daily self-examinations, including a temperature check prior to coming to work. Um, we have these things already in place for our staff. Um, and we actually have the summer for athletics, for summer school, um, uh, we, we have, um, we actually do conduct screening for students. Um, so uh, this is something that the task force is working through. Um, are we actually gonna screen students every day, um, take their temperatures? Um, are parents gonna be required um, to sign off every day that their students um, are not uh, feeling ill or exhibiting symptoms? That's something that our um, task force is working through right now. In regard to testing, again, um, cooperating with local health departments required. Um, students and staff who could become ill at school should be tested. That's a strong recommendation of both phases. 
Um, families should be notified of positive tests. That means if we do have a positive test here, whether it's a student or a staff member, um, our parent community is notified. Um, obviously, names aren't released uh, so that we aren't violating HIPAA or FERPA um, guidelines. And then uh, con contact trace uh, close contacts within uh, six feet for 15 minutes. That's the health department's guideline uh, to quarantine for 14 days. Athletics, um, our athletic director um, already has implemented um, these measures that uh, we're following. Um, you can see those um, again. Uh, um, there's um, some things that uh, aren't uh, specifically mentioned in phase five. Um, there are um, limits on stadium and indoor events uh, that are strongly recommended, um, as you can see in phase five. Um, Busing and transportation, um, hand sanitizer on the bus. Uh, you can see we kind of talked about this before, uh, facial coverings. Um, again, a lot of the required and strongly recommended. Um, and as far as cleaning goes, um, a lot of required and strongly recommended um, uh, from student desks wiped down after each class period um, um, to athletic equipment cleaned before and after each session, um, frequently touched surfaces as you can see. So now I'd like to talk about um, some instructional options. Um, our intent is to open face-to-face -face instruction in person five days a week. Um, some schools are looking at possibly an A-B schedule, bringing uh, maybe half the kids in um, on odd calendar days, the other half during even calendar days, um, in order to have less students uh, in the building at a time. Um, because uh, our area is relatively low risk, I say relatively medium risk to low risk um, uh, community spread, and because we have relatively small class sizes to begin with, um, we think that um, we can pull off face-to-face -face instruction five days a week. Um, and I say that in full transparency, that um, the school will have to look different to make that happen. Uh, but we think that the community uh, wants to send their kids to school five days a week. And if we could do it in compliance with the roadmap and health department guidelines and make it safe, um, then that's something that we should really target. Now, um, a lot of things can change between now and September 1st. So we need to be prepared for any scenario. We would also offer a 100% online program to students um, K through 12 for an entire semester or for the entire year. So what would in-person face-to-face look like? Um, the instructional part of it, um, the plan would be to start face-to-face -face five days a week. Again, that's the target that we would be shooting for, K through 12. The district is working with a third-party vendor um, for a platform, um, what we call a learning management system or LMS, and a full online curriculum to have available in case of school closures or quarantine. In other words, we could be um, a month into things and if there's a spike and we go back to phase one through three or our area has an exceptional um, spike and the health department asks us to close or 
if one of our schools has to close, et cetera, we will have um, a backup ready to go that our kids will have had exposure to um, at the beginning of the year, even face-to-face, -face, uh, teachers will work with them on it and that our staff is fully prepared. Um, we know that while what happened in March, um, uh, March 13th onward, um, I, our staff did an incredible job and our parents did an incredible job. The kids were great, but um, Google Classroom and um, a weekly schedule of every other day uh, without much structure um, isn't going to make it. And um, we are in a position that even if we start off face to face and close, we're going to have to account every day for attendance for a full day of learning. So we've got to beef up um, our learning platform, our professional development for our teachers and our online ability to teach if that's necessary. So all staff would receive professional development and online learning the platform in the curriculum. Um, and we would probably, again, face-to-face -face instruction will also include some online learning in the platform and curriculum so students are familiar, especially at the beginning of the year, so that we can switch quickly between online, um, between face-to-face -face and remote. So the online option for the semester or for a whole year would be offered again to all K through 12 Harbor Springs students. Um, it would be provided by Harbor Springs, but with an online platform or learning management system and curriculum through a third party vendor. It would be a robust curriculum that aligns with the Michigan standards and benchmarks. Daily attendance would be required probably you know, four to five hours a day. Um, assignments, projects, and assessments uh, would be graded. It's, it would be much different than what students had in the spring of 2020. A Harbor Springs teacher may or may not be the teacher of record. Um, whatever system we have um, for our online students, there will be a teacher attached to it. It just won't be um, here, go do this independently. There will be a teacher assigned to the student for each course or for a, an entire student's schedule. It may be a Harbor Springs teacher or it may not be. It may be another teacher in Michigan. Um, we would ask uh, parents to make a commitment for at least an entire semester. Um, and uh, uh, so that we don't have a bunch of um, students switching from an online platform to face-to-face, -face, then back to online again. Um, students that are fully online for a semester, we would ask to make that commitment uh, because they will be at a different pace than those students learning face-to-face. -face. They may even have a different um, curriculum. The same standards and benchmarks will be covered, but through a different curriculum possibly. So right now we are in our final stages of planning. Um, we continue weekly consultation with the Health Department of Northwest Michigan and area districts. Um, our task force will be finalizing the plan to be improved uh, by the Board of Education. Our board approval may actually occur over two meetings. Um, we are most likely gonna uh, schedule a special meeting uh, for April 4th uh, for the board to hear some of the plan and then uh, uh, also as on August 10th to hear the rest of the plan. Uh, some might get some parts of the plan might get approved as early as April 4th uh, with the rest of it August 10th or it might all get approved August 10th. We feel that we need a plan to be approved as soon as possible so that parents can make some informed decisions about what they want to do as far as um, sending their students to school to start with us face-to-face -face or choosing a fully online option. I will tell you that, um, and I don't, I, I go, I'm going out on a limb and saying this. So 
um, I, I, I guess I'm putting myself out there um, by saying this, that our task force is considering phase five, the strong recommendations and recommendations more as requirements if they are feasible, um, if that indeed is the phase that we open in. And I think part of the rationale is number one, we want it, we would rather err on the side of safety. And number two, um, if we're in a position where we're going between phase four and phase five a couple of times during the year, if our status changes, that's hard for students. Oh, we're in phase five this week, uh, but next week we're gonna go in phase four. So we're gonna implement a whole new set of protocols to follow. We think that that's confusing. And um, um, so that's my gut feeling. Um, I don't know that for sure because this still needs to be vetted out by our task force committee and get approved by the board. But again, we understand that parents need to know this information to make informed decisions. And, um, you know, I, again, the elephant in the room um, regarding masks, um, you know, there's, like anything else, if you want something to support your position, you'll probably find a study. Um, but I, I think that, you know, many of us have seen charts like this. And what I like about this is there's no percentages applied to this because I don't think we really know that. But we know if um, everybody's wearing a mask, everybody's probably safer than if uh, some, no one's wearing a mask or some people are wearing a mask and some aren't. Um, and we know that there's been, we've heard about studies with children under 10 not being able to transmit. You know, I, I don't know how well those studies are vetted or if they're peer reviewed or whatever, um, but we know that, again, uh, erring on the side of safety um, might, you know, um, might be wise in something like this, especially with a virus that we know still relatively little about. So some factors to consider uh, when the plan does get approved and you have that information, if, what, whether to send your student to school or opt for a fully online option. Um, certainly, um, your child's current health and risk factors related to COVID, your child's learning style, uh, your family's current health or risk factors uh, related to COVID, your personal and family feelings regarding restrictions and um, requirements that we're gonna put in place for um, being face-to-face, -face. Your, your child's ability to be self-paced, and obviously the dynamics within your household. Um, having um, a kindergarten and first grader, second grader, fully online, as you know, even with a robust learning management system with a teacher um, helping to manage that from a distance is still very, uh, I think, um, parent facilitated would, would be an understatement. Uh, older children, maybe not so much. So steps we've already taken, we've been consulting weekly with the Health Department of Northwest Michigan uh, Lisa Peacock, uh, Susan Pulaski, um, Dr. Uh, Meyerson. Uh, we, we did a survey of parents and staff early on in the summer, but we realized things have changed since then. We've been securing PPE, masks, plexiglass shields, um, et cetera. We have purchased state-of-the-art sanitizing equipment for students and buses. Um, we have hand uh, installing hand sanitizer dispensers in all locations, uh, touchless paper towel dispensers in all large bathrooms and locker rooms. We're increasing our, our daytime cleaning personnel. As you know, we've investigated, or uh, maybe I didn't make that clear, but we're looking at uh, a few online curriculum and LMS um, platforms. And um, our school reopening task force has met multiple times. Uh, the work that still remains, continue consultation with the health department, um, finalizing the plan and board of ed approval, uh, hopefully over uh, 
April 6th and April 10th dates, uh, communicating that plan to Harbor Springs Public Schools students, staff, and parents, um, surveying parents and staff again regarding their uh, intent to return to school, and then um, opening a registration window for the 100% online option. What can parents do to help? I think, um, you know, being positive with your child. Again, that social emotional piece is huge. Um, it's July 27th, you know, we have the month of August and, you know, school will be here. And, um, you know, for many students, that's uh, anxiety uh, ridden to begin with. So uh, being positive with your child and talking about school and what it could look like. Um, practicing wearing masks and finding one or two or three that are comfortable um, probably is a good idea if you do intend to send your child. Um, and discussing the options as a family for what type of learning will be best. Again, I know you can't make these decisions now, maybe some of you can, uh, but as soon as more information comes out. And then um, keep in touch with us. Um, you know, check the website often. We do have a, a school reopening page that we started. Um, like Harbor Springs Public Schools on Facebook, I use that a lot to uh, communicate. Don't hesitate to email me or phone me um, with any questions or concerns or one of our principals or staff. So I would like to... I think it might be quicker if I just walked over. Uh, <laughs> Chris is joining me and we're gonna address some of the questions. Okay, uh, quite a few of them on, on the site, as you can see. Um, yeah, I'll, try, I'll just try to take them in order from the top going down. Um, uh, one question came up that I forwarded to Tina. Will parents be able to enroll their children if they choose to stay here in their vacation home from other states if they are not permanent residents of Harvey Springs? The question was, um, if a, a family is not a, um, if this is a family's second home and they typically don't uh, reside in Harbor Springs year round, can I enroll my student? Yes, you can. You're a property owner here. Um, if your child, um, we always use the um, a principle of where your child lays his head every night is where um, you should send your child to school. So the answer is yes. You may visit Tina Haas at Harvard Springs High School Monday through Friday from uh, 8 to 3.30 and she will be glad to enroll you. If there's any questions, send me an email or give me a call. Okay, uh, Leah, I have a question. on. Um... If, if there is a positive case found in the student, how would we handle that? Is there a plan for that? And so then there's a whole class quarantine, there's a teacher quarantine, what about siblings? So the question was, if there is a, a positive case identified here at school, what would happen? Um, would the whole school quarantine would the class quarantine, including the teacher, and that we would take under advisement from the health department. What the health department does is contact, trace um, those, those people that a student would have been in contact with, close contact for 15 minutes or more, six uh, feet apart or less. Now, one of the things that the health department did tell us is if they were quite confident that students in the classroom were all wearing masks the entire time, and uh, especially in elementary school where students are in cohorts, then um, the whole class would not necessarily have to quarantine. Uh, again, that. Um, I don't want to write that down and etch it in cement, but um, that is what uh, the conversation with the health department has been like. But they would advise us. 
uh, questions from Dewey. Um, um, what is the high school doing regarding vocational education? The question is, what about vocational education? And um, it's a really good question. We would default to what the um, the particular site that they're going to, if it's Petoskey or Pelston, um, uh, I, I don't know if we send, I don't think we send too many kids to Boyne City. Um, typically it's Petoskey or Pelston. Um, the protocols that we have in place are pretty gonna be pretty similar as those around the ISD. I'm in um, weekly meetings with the other superintendents as well from SHARM ISD. So I think um, I'm, I'm pretty confident that uh, they'll be following very similar protocols if, if and when they um, go to uh, their voc ed classes out of district. Julie is asking, in, in the slide that you had between where you have strong recommendation or strongly recommended and, um, and recommended, right? You know, we have a couple of those. Um, she's wondering how the school district translates the levels of recommendation. So the question is um, how do we um, translate when, when it's a requirement? a strong recommendation and a recommendation, how do we translate that into what we're actually gonna do? One of the things um, that we have to put in our plan is we have to make a rationale for every strong recommendation that we don't follow, we have to give a rationale as to why. And, um, you know, I, I, I think that these, recommendations and requirements um they took a while for the advisory council to get these out it was a, um, a lot there were a lot of stakeholders on this committee health professionals um uh, school personnel uh, parents um you know and we we feel that if some, I, I think for the most part, our task force feels if this group of people that really gave this a lot of thought, um, called something a strong recommendation or a recommendation, if, if it's totally not feasible and we just can't pull it off. For example, there are gonna be some classrooms where no matter what we do, we're not gonna be able to ensure a six foot distance or get the desks all facing the same way. It's just impossible to. Um, we might not be able to pull that off, but there are some things that are strong recommendations or recommendations that we can pull off and do. Are they gonna be easy? Are they gonna be logistics? Are people gonna be upset? Is it gonna look the same? Probably not. Um, I, one thing that came up just as a general, and I know this to be true, uh, I think we have a typo on the slide that says April. I think we mean August on all of those. So that's that's just a, a technical piece. But the other one that came up was um, the when do we need to make a decision about the online versus the, the on ground choices? So Chris said. Uh, Chris pointed out that uh, there was um, a couple of so slides that said April. And um, I call that a Behrman blunder. <laughs> so I apologize. Um, sorry about that. <laughs> uh, but sure, right? what, what would be the timeline of a parent making that decision? What would our window of registration be? Um, you know, I, we would we would want to make a decision relatively quickly because that's going to impact how we deploy our staff for example if we have a large number of students at elementary that are going to be taught um, online we may want to have one of our staff do that take those students for the entire semester or year 
we might want to have one of our staff do that. Um, and, and same thing at the high school, if enough um, students uh, would warrant assigning our staff to teach that. So it becomes a staffing issue because then I'd have to hire staff to replace those staff. Um, so there is some urgency, but we realize that parents need time too. So uh, our hope is that shortly after April 10th, uh, <laughs> it, Sorry. I don't know why I have April on my mind, August 10th, um, shortly after that date, August 10th, we would um, open a window up uh, and keep it open for at least a week or week and a half or so for parents to make that decision. Hopefully, we will be able to get some information out even sooner than that. Along those lines, um, with, the, with the August 10th window, would there be opportunity for the um, parents to review the online option um, as, as we settle on a provider or a plan for that? Chris asked, um, one of the questions in the chat was, would it be possible for parents to review the online uh, option once we know who the provider is uh, in the platform? Uh, I would like to say yes, um, that I, we would um, uh, see if we can get demos out there or direct the parents to the website to see the course catalogs um, and uh, see some demo lessons. I think that would be a, a nice thing as a parent. I would like that. So uh, I would hope that we could provide that. There's a couple of questions on if we provide, if the student is participating in online learning, how does that uh, impact participation in school? The question is, if a student is participating in online learning, how does that um, affect participation in sports? That student can fully participate in sports or the extracurriculars that we have um, available, providing they are um, available, um, that student would still be a Harbor Springs Public School student, earning credit here at Harbor Springs. That's the uh, learning delivery model that that student would use but that student could still participate in after school sports and activities. Um, again, providing that uh, those are all occurring. Okay. Um, along the lines of the, of the follow up with the positive testing, I guess one of the questions would be, is there, what, what kind of, I guess the time frame, like, you know, the question comes up is, will parents be notified immediately there's a suspected confirmed case within a child school or class. The question is, would if we did have a positive case here at school, would parents be notified um, quickly, immediately? Um, it would always be my intent to get out quick information as soon as it's available. Um, I, I, you know, do our we do our best to do that. And I would say in this case, yes, we'd want um, parents to know, you know, we know the whole issue of testing is one that um, unfortunately takes time. And, you know, we're hopeful just like everybody else that they could get the, the time that it takes to get the results back trimmed down a little bit. But as, as soon as we find out and are communicated that through the health department, then we would let our parents know. Um, how is it will students be able to transfer to online learning if they're uncomfortable in the classroom? The question is, uh, how, how will a student, how easily or how will a student make the transition from um, in person instruction if they're uncomfortable with that to online. And and I really, that's one that I can't answer. Um, you know, every student's different. Parents, you know your students the best. Um, some of our students in March, when we close down, actually thrive in this type of learning environment. Um, I can't, I can tell you that it probably won't be like that because I think it's gonna be a lot more regimented and demanding the fully online option, 
uh, but every student's different and um, um, has a different learning style. <laughs> <laughs> doing well. Um, I'm kind of scanning through to see which ones are repeats on here. Sorry about that. Um, well, I, I guess you know, what kind of response have you received from non residents, vacational owners who have requested and further enroll the children to the district? And along those lines, I, I guess it's similar to the testing question, right? You know, um, how, do, how do we uh, maintain, because we still maintain small class sizes? With, uh, with that and, and some sort of uh, tracing with that. So the question is, um, what has the response been from uh, uh, seasonal families that have decided to make this year, maybe this year, maybe for good, Harbor Springs, their home um, where their students would go to school here for the year. Um, I, you know, I've talked to a couple people um we need to remember that we um put a total halt on schools of choice this year we are not accepting one new school of choice student unless there's an older sibling already here under schools of choice that means students from outside of the district so um we did that to keep class sizes small um my hunch is that there will be um, a percentage of parents that don't want to send their students to school face to face, at least for the first semester and maybe for the whole year. So in the end, I, I would think that things balance each other out a little bit. And, um, you know, we're, we're going to welcome any student here that has a residence here that's, um, again, laying their head down on the pillow in the school district of Harbor Springs with open arms and do our uh, best to keep every child safe and my staff safe as well. Uh, a question on, um, will Black, specifically with Blackbird, will Blackbird students be able to leave the classroom for special library and cafeteria? Uh, Chris asked one of the questions in the chat was specific to Blackbird, which houses pre-K through one, um, along with child care. The question was, will students um, in Blackbird be allowed to leave the classroom to go to library, to go to specials? You know, again, we're, we're trying to figure that out. Um, I don't want to tell you yes and then all of a sudden it's no um i hope that you know obviously we need to make that decision um i think when again when students are wearing masks it gives you a little bit more um, flexibility of movement to some degree we still need to worry about distancing um but if we can get like the art room sanitized in between classes coming um, or the music room. Um, we know gym will be outside to the greatest extent possible. We're encouraging our teachers to take their kids out. You know, learning might look a little bit different. It might not be at, um, the academics might not come at such a fast pace because we've got to do some things different. Um, and you know, I kind of throw that out there between hand washing and you know, trying to get the kids outside on a regular basis and, you know, um, but um, I, I don't have an answer. The bottom line is I don't have an answer. I think um, a, a lot of it depends if we're wearing masks or not wearing masks and the degree that we think we can get those rooms cleaned in between classes coming in. Kids are still traveling in cohorts, so that's good. You know, it's not like we mix the kids up, then send them so they're still with their kind of family unit um, going to the art room. Um, we might have supplies. Kids might have to be using their own supplies in art, or we might have disposable supplies, or you know, for each kid or staff or class. Um, a question, which I think is more of a clarification. So the question is, 
how will the transition work from in-person learning to online learning if the student has to be quarantined? Or if we transition from phase four to phase three, if we're using an online system that has a different curriculum than for students on the first. So someone, um, all these questions are excellent, first of all. Um, and the question was asked, uh, how would we transition from being face-to-face -to, -face to online? Um, and the question cited a couple of scenarios. If we went from phase four to phase three, so that means the entire class, or let's say a student was quarantined at home for a couple of weeks. Well, what our plan is, is we would get kids used to the learning platform while they are here um, and maybe do a couple of lessons a week out of the online curriculum. And the nice thing about both of the curriculums that were, the, the three curriculums actually that we're looking at is that teachers can load their own um, um, curricular materials into those platforms. They're pretty flexible. So um, as the year goes on um, and our, our staff gets um, more um, familiar with whatever system we go with, um, quite possibly we can load more and more stuff on. We, we're learning that some of our online programs right now, like uh, TCI uh, social studies at the middle school, can be easily loaded on uh, the, the learning platforms we're looking at. So those are all positive things. And if a student, let's say, was home for two weeks, um, that teacher would assign the student out of that um, online, our online uh, module and platform um, and work with that student and maybe Zoom a little bit with that student um, if, if possible, maybe Zoom with the whole classroom, but that student could be completing assignments daily uh, in that learning platform because that student will have been used to it um, and the teacher would uh, do the appropriate assignments that match the current unit that they're in. Um. We've got more questions that are coming in Raspberry Pi, and I don't know how long you wanted to. You want to answer one more, and then we'll try. No, to we can we can go. Um, let's take a few more questions. Okay. Um, um, let's see. I'm scrolling my way through, like I said, there's some there's some new part a lot right here at the end here. Um, um, why do we need a third party for the online system? I think you answered this again already, but. Uh, Maybe well, the question is, why do we need a third party um, vendor? First of all, um, there are some schools. Um, I, I came from prior to coming to Harbor Springs. I was down in Rochester. That's a 15,000 student district with 950 teaching staff. They uh, have spent a better part of the summer writing their own virtual um, school curriculum that their teachers are gonna teach. They, they have a scale in which they can do that. Um, we don't, and it's, um, I don't expect our teachers to um, come up with a curriculum, load it all into a platform, be ready to go the first day of school, teach it, not only teach those students that they have face to face, but then to teach the kids that are fully online. I think that's a lot to ask for a teacher um, for anybody to do. And we want those staff that are teaching face-to-face -to, -face to be able to fully concentrate on those kids in front of them, keep them safe, um, keep themselves safe. Not also when they're done with that, then teach a student that's fully online for the entire semester. So that's why, you know, we would go with a third-party contractor. Now, if we had a scale, if um, if the number suggested that, yeah, you know, we could actually go out and hire a Harbor Springs teacher to teach those students or have one of our teachers teach those students and hire a uh, staff member um, for that teacher, then, you know, that's a different story. A lot of it just depends on the number. I'm going to give you a series of questions that are all revolving around masks. Um, enforcing. Um, 
enforcing mask wearing? What about final floor plans or medical exemptions for masks? And will Blackford students be in a mask full time? So the question is, what about mask enforcement? If indeed students are wearing masks um, for a majority of the day or all the time inside or whatever this task force lands on. Um, what about those students uh, on 504s or have a medical condition? And um, will Blackbird students be wearing masks? So, you know, we're not going to call the law enforcement and uh, that students aren't wearing masks. And we're not, um, we're, we're going to, we want people to be safe. So, you know, our teachers are kind. They're, um, they know how to approach children. You know, I think there'll, there'll be a lot of gentle reminders, um, you know, and um, if a student, let's say, just became so non-compliant and, you know, uh, defiant and argumentative and was really giving the teacher a difficult time, then we would probably call the student's parent like we would normally do in a situation like that. Um, regarding students that are on 504s or, um, you know, either medically fragile or whatever, we will follow what the 504 plan and doctor says. You know, so if a physician says that the student shouldn't wear a mask, maybe the student um, could wear, could wear a shield or whatever, we would comply with those 504 plans in medical uh, and, and ask for a physician's note. In regard to Blackbird students, I don't know that yet. Um, if, you know, that's something that we have to decide. I think we need to, again, look at, um, you know, how restrictive do we want to be with other things? And can we put students in a Blackbird classroom six feet apart and keep them that way? Um, we, for our Blackbird Child Care Center, the children aren't in masks. Uh, and they are, um, you know, babies through um, five, four and five. Um, child care operates under a different set of rules, but we're not going to put infants or toddlers in masks. Um, our Harvard kids, though, wear them. So um, that's something that uh, we're going to be deciding. But I have to make sure also my staff is safe. I can't say this enough. Um, nationally, one out of every four teachers is in a high risk category for COVID. I don't know what our numbers are, but I do know this. If our staff gets sick, then we're out of luck. You know, that's, and we want to do our best to keep school open five days a week, face to face. So we might have to put some things in place that no one likes. Uh, I don't like sitting here uh, in a, a hot, stuffy room with Chris right across the desk from me. <laughs> the air went off at five. Right. <laughs> um, you, you know, and I know a youngster isn't going to like it either in a hot classroom. Like, you know, that's why we want to be able to get the kids outside as much as we can, give them you know, whatever breaks we can from you know, wearing a mask. Well, there's, there's a, a few more questions here, but I think they're pretty specific, and I think that, that, that's some of the stuff we're working through in the textbook. But I do want to, uh, at, at the end here, we've got a couple, um, you know, I'll quote one uh, from Charlie. It says, uh, Mr. Bearman, thank you for hosting, explaining, and having the courage to feel both of these questions at a difficult time. And from uh, Molly, so then we appreciate it. So thank you very much for taking time to do this, and we'll keep working on the rest of them as uh, as we move forward. Well, um, I I wish I had more answers for you, the definitive answers right now. Um, maybe we'll come back in a couple weeks and do another town hall. 
um, and be able to answer things more definitively. Um, and I can get the date right and not put April in there. Um, but uh, I love this community. I, your kids mean everything in the world to me and our staff. And um, we're trying to do our best. We're not going to make, no matter what we do, we're not going to make a lot of people happy. We know that. Um, so one of the things that um, I, I really have heard about, um, uh, go ahead and uh, Google uh, Dr. Michael, Michael Osterholm uh, out of the University of Minnesota, the um, Center for Infectious Disease Research and Policy. Um, he does a lot a lot of stuff on this topic and puts out a weekly podcast. It's just really interesting. Some of the stuff I you know, don't agree with, some of it I do. But one of the things that he noted is flexibility, flexibility, flexibility. And we're all going to have to be flexible with this. Um, so anyways, I appreciate you all for joining in. And uh, I'm going to sign off. And you know where to find me. So everyone take care and thank you. Thank you.